Welcome to Analyzing Finance with Nick. This is our first live in-person interview that I've done off of Zoom. And I have a special guest, uh, my good friend, Christian White. Hey, guys. Uh, he is an expert on both um, networking and on commercial real estate. So can you tell the audience a little bit about your background? Yeah. So, you know, I'm, I'm like, like Nick, I'm originally from uh, California. I'm actually from uh, the central part of the state, central California, and, um, you know, went to uh, join the Navy after, uh, after college and uh, following my, uh, my naval career, went into commercial real estate, did that for a bit, and then uh, found myself in uh, Orange County about a year and a half ago and have since segued into, um, you know, entrepreneurship into, into different verticals and such. And so, um, you know, currently have two social groups, one in uh, Newport Beach and the other one in Beverly Hills. And, you know, just recently authored a book on social capital. And I feel like now is a really critical time as it relates to that, where we are as a society. Yeah, people know of financial capital, especially the viewers of this channel. They know about human capital, just the value of labor, which is increasingly getting commoditized in many industries. But how do you really quantify social capital? Yeah, I mean, it, 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 that's, the, that's the thing that's challenging is, is how do you quantify something that has a qualitative component? So, um, you know, I guess you can almost do kind of like, uh, I'm thinking of some of these tests, like in, uh, in finance, like was it Sharpe's ratio is one of them yeah. where you, where you weigh in, uh, numerically. So, you know, I, I would say you can create your own point system. That, that might be a way to, to quantify it. Yeah. Now you're um, sounding like Bridgewater. Yeah. <laughs> but it's, it's pretty challenging. I mean, to, yeah, to really, I guess you, you would, you would somehow you'd take incorporate a Sharpe's ratio to it. But the thing is, is that in terms of the reason why I asked that question is not really necessarily to provide a raw number. That was more of a, a humor. But in the sense of how do you know if your time being spent building your social network is worth your while? Yeah. Well, I, I, you know, ultimately you don't know. It, it's speculative, much like many things in life uh, are. Um, what, what I can tell you is um, you know, your, your social capital, your Rolodex, your, your network, if you will, uh, is probably the greatest asset that you have. Um, many people throughout history, okay, and especially a lot of prominent people in business today, uh, have relied on social capital to get them into opportunities. And so, you know, as it relates to that, um, yeah, absolutely critical. And how important is the social media component to this is like somebody's following on social media, an accurate proxy to the strength of their social network, or is it more posturing? I would say yes and no. I mean, there's a, there's an element of it that is, you know, that is van that is a vanity, you know, like your followers and so on and so forth likes, if you will. And those things are great. Don't get me wrong. And in today's society, people do place a lot of weight on that. Uh, there was one, I think it was it one of the ladies from game of Thrones uh, her name is Sophia, blanking out on the name. But uh, anyhow, wow. she said one of the reasons why she got the role was simply because uh, di the director slash producer uh, really took stock of her social media presence compared to another uh, gal uh, who was looking to be, um, be, be on the show. And so long story short, um, it, it's critical but I can tell you this, and a lot of really well-connected, very successful people that are not even on social media or they're on it and they have a very small footprint on there. So uh, while it's uh, while there's a vanity play to it and it, it does hold weight, in other ways, it's not really the full picture. And it's the other thing is, is that I've been reading your book. It's The Fast Lane to Relationships. Yeah. And one of the... Th paradoxical things that I saw that was actually very insightful was the idea of throwing a party is actually the most time and financially efficient ways to build a network and develop connections. Yeah. So as Nick was alluding to, and that's one of the main focal points of the book, which is, Hey, the fastest way to build relationships. And, and by the way, the, the book is a play on words 
with the other book, you know, Millionaire Fast Lane, where, you know, there's a slow lane and then there's a fast lane. And, you know, the book that I've, that I've published is, is seeks to distill that by putting together mixers. Now, what are mixers? They could be, you know, simply going to someone's house and uh, putting on some industry specific affair, or it could be, um, you know, you go into a restaurant or to, on a board a yacht or a really nice home and you're, you're putting something on where you're bringing people together, people where people can, um, you know, mix and mingle and, and be in an environment where they can just kind of relax. So, and that is one of the best ways to meet people fast. Why? Because it gives you a great reason to reach out to somebody. Uh, when I, when I put on events, when, you know, we've done yacht events, we've done estate events. You know, I, I always joke with people. I say, well, who the hell doesn't want to go enjoy those things? Most people do. And well, it doesn't need to be something opulent like that, but, uh, act, you know, putting, bringing people together, inviting people, having a legitimate reason to reach out at this day and age right now where people are pretty sequestered and lonely, this is one of the best things to do. Yeah. I kind of looked at it a little differently than you on this is that I thought about how much time I'd have to spend if I went out for coffee or lunch for 30 different people. Yep. Ever like that would be at least 30 hours of my time and probably um, $600 worth of food and drinks that I'm spending on mm -hmm. that. Whereas if I have them all come to a party, it's maybe three or four hours and I have a chance to chat with all of them. Yeah. And there's a higher probability that they will all show up. Mm -hmm. And so I, somebody who's not really more of an introvert and not really a big party guy, but I kind of flipped on that because I was like, wait, this is kind of a way to gather a lot of people, especially in the world where people just don't have time to all meet you for lunch. Like, mm -hmm. especially if you wanted to catch up with all of your friends, say like once every three months and you have a hundred people to catch up with, then you're going to have to have plans for coffee or happy hour or lunch every day or more than every day, actually, because there's only 90 days and three mm -hmm. months on average. And so that is kind of one of the insights that I got from Christian's book, uh, Outside of the idea of events being the most efficient way to socialize, what are some other like opposite is true type of paradoxical things you see in terms of building a network that is not really conventional advice? Yeah. So uh, for one, and and I know we kind of touched on it earlier and such, and, and people more or less kind of are aware, hey, look, you know, if you're not on social media, get on social media. And while a lot of people are on social media, a lot of them don't show their face or they don't engage or, or post it, you know, look, if you're in business and if you're trying to make a dent in the universe, so to speak, it behooves you to make your presence known. So I encourage people to learn everything they can about the attention economy that we're in, uh, learn about content creation. Now, obviously not all of us have the time in the world to focus on editing and, and doing things of that nature, but learn what you can. And even if you make a post once a month, it's better than not doing it. So for one, Having that social media presence, curating it, focusing on it is very important. Secondly, having a personal website. A lot of people don't have a personal website. A lot of people rely on their company uh, and such to have that, that presence on, on, on the web. So social media, personal website. I also recommend writing if you can. We're all an expert in our own way uh, based off you know a given topic, so to speak. So if you can write, whether it's articles, whether it's uh, just LinkedIn uh, posts, uh, whether it, it's uh, you know producing content on on platforms like YouTube or Instagram, LinkedIn, writing a book, you know th that's in a podcast. These are all different things that most people don't do. So th those are some things offhand I would suggest. And there's other things that yeah, it's just to play devil's yeah. advocate here though. Now the fact that it's so easy to make a podcast or a YouTube channel or um, a social Instagram account, how do you stand out without just being extremely offensive level polarizing or um just that apart from that it's just there's not really actually let me reward that yeah actually the question i have is if everybody's making like a youtube channel or a podcast or a sub stack or mm -hmm. whatever way that they want to express their ideas how do you stand out in the crowd like is it worth it if everybody's doing it does that devalue the uh the idea of having a social media presence? Uh, to answer your question, no. Uh, and the reason is, and I was talking with someone else earlier today on the phone about it, which is 
Yes, we are. We do live in a congested world as it relates to content. Everyone is trying to get into it. You know, Goldman Sachs, of course, released that study that the creator economy is supposed to be worth, I think, four four hundred fifty billion by the year twenty twenty seven, and it's the fastest growing of the small business enterprises. And so that's where it really is incumbent upon those of us creating content to find a niche and get into as specific. Uh, in that niche topic as possible. So like a sub niche. And so you're an expert and you just stay in your lane and you focus on it and, and, you know, hone your craft. And so, so yeah. And quality is more important because there's so much information out there. You've got to be producing uh, content uh, that is high quality instead of just pushing stuff up. So yes, a hundred percent still do it. And you don't need to have a whole lot of people. Uh, to, uh, to, to, to have, make, make a footprint. You know, some of these people on you, I'll use YouTube as a case study because I've been spending time on that. You don't need to have a million subscribers or even 500,000, of course, as, as we know. You could have literally just a thousand people. You're diehard people that love you. They love your brand, what you represent, and you're dispensing value to them. And, you know, that in of itself is, uh, will, will pay immense dividends. So there, there's room for everybody. I mean, YouTube, for example, has like two point two or 2.6 billion people. Well, the crazy thing is that only about 9% of channels have more than a thousand subscribers and only about 7% have more than 1500. And I would attribute that to so many people don't treat a platform like YouTube seriously. And I suspect that's probably the reason behind so many channels going dormant and not being able to monetize or not being able to really make a mark. Because they're not, they're treating it as a hobby, as a part-time thing, not not a full-time venture, if you will. Yeah, and then also the other question I'm going to get from more tech-savvy and introverted people viewing this is that, well, in the era of the internet and how I can find anybody's email online and I can apply to jobs online and I could show my talent by just writing a, a case study on Substack or other whatever media makes sense to do it. Why does it matter who I know at this point? Shouldn't my talent be able to stand out by itself and just reaching out to people online? What is the importance of in-person meetings in a world where you can prove yourself without having to leave your house? Yeah, you know, despite how easy it is to connect with people and such, people still want to meet in the flesh with others. There's, 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 there's nothing like meeting, reading someone's vibe in person, feeling their energy and such. Uh, totally different element. And a classic example would be, you know, something that goes on on the other side of the world. Let's say something unfortunate happens to somebody, okay? Uh, and, you know, we hear it all the time in the news. It doesn't have any emotional impact on us. Conversely, if we were to have met that person, even if it was just shaking their hand, having a brief uh, interaction with them, there's a, there, there, there would be some component of us that would feel um, remorseful and, and ha be impacted emotionally by it. So, you know, I always tell people whether you're going on dates or it's business, the phone is for setting up a time to get together. That's what the phone is for. The phone, you know, you, it's like, you know, when you ask one on a date, right, you, you, you make, you, you set up the date and then you get off the phone and you save her, you, you, you save that build up to when you meet in person, the same thing in business. So if you can meet in person, person. Yeah. And why has networking then become such a bad word? Well, I, you know, and I, I try and refrain from using it, even though here I'm using it on this, on this video here. So uh, networking, you know, I think for some people, and it, it does for me at least, conjure up images of people at some function, whether it's a chamber or a rotary club, and they're, you know, whipping out their business cards like it's no one's business, trying to identify who can be of value to them and whatnot. So I think it, it, it does kind of have a, a, it can carry a negative connotation, Um you know, that's why I try to use other words here and there creatively to, to be more engaging and, and, and original. But, uh, I mean, it's, it's incredible, incredibly important to, to really have that down. And I, and I tell people too, IQ operates the world and EQ runs it. This is not my quote, by the way. The gentleman's name eludes me who once said it, but I love that. And it's so true. And then the, end of the last question, which kind of goes into the root of your book is say you're a young guy or girl just finished college and has a new job, or you're somebody who has moved to a new city from scratch, a new metropolitan area, say we flew from New York to Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. What would you do to 
build your network from scratch. If you had to restart today, what would you, what would what's like step yeah. one to ten to like get from zero to having an integral role in the community and people reaching out to you for opportunities? Okay, so first thing I would do if I did <clears throat> if I didn't have a social media presence, create a social media presence. Focus on one or two of those. For me, I focus on Instagram and I focus on LinkedIn and as of recently, more YouTube. But mainly Instagram and LinkedIn. I, I hone it and I focus on those things so I don't get distracted with TikTok and all, Facebook and all this other stuff. Okay, that's number one. Number two, create a personal website. It separates yourself. Okay, that, that, that's easy. Do that. The website can be created and up and running within 36, 48 hours. And then what I would do is make a friend wherever you go. So if you're going from like New York to Orange County or, or something, make a friend immediately. And then whatever industry you're in, put on a social function doesn't need to be extravagant. Put on a social function where you can invite people in your neck of the woods, your new location to invite to and enjoy hors d'oeuvres, drinks, and maybe some entertainment. Yeah, but maybe it's like you're skipping a few steps. Like if you just like, do you, have, do you know enough people in your industry who would show up? How do you get from that the, point? The, that point you know? This, well, of course, there's different variables. This is under the assumption that you go and work for a company, right? Is, okay. is that it? So if you're if you're going someplace, let's say you're in um, investment banking or something, you're in commercial real estate, and you you come from the East Coast and you're in the West Coast, uh, what you would do is you would leverage the people, your colleagues, your coworkers. Hey, I would like to put it together like a social function. I'd like to meet some people. You leverage the people in your in your immediate sphere. There. The other thing you can do, and depending on how gregarious you are, is you can literally just go out. So for example, when I first moved to Newport Beach, I didn't know anybody. And I'd actually go out by myself to, to just meet and connect with people. So by by literally going out, asking questions, go to, here's another great one. Here's another great one. Go to one restaurant, go to the, go to the restaurant uh, that's really high end where you think your target demographic is. If that's your target demographic. Go there just about every day. You don't even need to go out and spend a fortune on meals if you don't want, but just grab a drink. A drink doesn't even need to be alcoholic. It can be fill in the blank. Okay. But go there every day and tip and take care of your, uh, the, the staff there, bartenders, wait, uh, waitresses, et cetera. Take care of them. You will, you will have a new friend. Okay. I guarantee you within, you know, the, the first few weeks and you keep going there every day, you're building a relationships and a presence. You're going to know a lot of people and they're going to make introductions, inter introductions, <laughs> introductions for you. Uh, so you can, uh, you know, meet other people that, so that's how you do it. You start to build it. You start, you're putting yourself out there. Yeah. And, um, well, before we wrap things up, what do you, do you have anything interesting about your outlook of what's going on in commercial real estate land? You've seen supply gluts coming right now in offices and apartments, but is this the time just to kind of wait it out or are there still opportunities out there? Yeah. Well, I wish I wasn't as involved as I, as I once was in that space. Um, while interest rates have obviously gone up, I still think there's, there's always opportunity out there, of course. And people are always finding, um, you know, ways to make a buck, if you will, whether it's an up or down market, it is more challenging with, again, where the rates are at and such. Multifamily has become a very congested space, obviously with office being what it is after the pandemic. Um, there might be some repurposing purposes as well. And so, you know, I'd say as a whole, you know, there, there, there's opportunity. I think that's where creative financing is going to have a bigger role. It, you know, so they're, they're, they're out there. And before we go, Christian, do you have any final things that you want to say to the audience about uh, whether it's advanced level networking or real estate or anything in your niche that we are not really discussed previously in this video? You know, I, I think we pretty much covered the, the main topics as it relates to it. Um, learn everything you can about attention economy, okay? Curate that experience on social media and leverage uh, the social mixers. And, and, and in the book, I, I, by the way, all the proceeds go to benefit a veterans organization. Uh, the book, I go into more details where you're leveraging things like gifts, memes, and other unconventional methods to really stand out. Yeah, and for the book is The Fast Lane to Building Relationships, written by Christian White. And I know this isn't our normal like kind of topic on this channel, but I know a lot of you guys ask about 
these type of questions about how to maximize human capital. So I figured I'd bring on an expert that I know to go into that. And thank you for joining us. Yeah. And yeah, we're glad to have you back. Well, thanks for having me on. And, um, you know, this has been a great opportunity. Thanks, guys.